I'd like to tell you a few things about Scott Simon. He has had a very interesting life. After high school in Chicago, he attended three prestigious universities, one at a time, but didn't graduate. His first real job was at a group home for adults with cognitive disabilities, which perhaps deepened his innate compassion for people who are different. He started his journalism career not at an establishment mainstream media outlet, but on the counterculture fringe, writing for a kind of sketchy underground newspaper in Chicago. He freelanced for the local NPR station and at 25 became NPR's first bureau chief in Chicago, a bureau of one. The rest, as they say, is history. Today, on every Saturday morning, some four million Americans start their weekend with the friendly, folksy, but authoritative voice of Scott Simon, who has hosted Weekend Edition Saturday since 1985, when he was all of 33 years old. We've heard several, yes, indeed, what a run. <laughs> you can do the math on his age. He's a, he's a few years younger than I am. He's very, very young. Now, well, we've heard several times tonight, and it's absolutely true, that the essence of great journalism is storytelling. And Scott Simon is an extraordinary storyteller. Maybe because there are two great storytelling traditions in his parental genes, Jewish and Irish. <laughs> Scott tells stories of real life, of tragedy, joy, love, perseverance. His weekly commentaries on a topic in the news that week for which he won a Peabody Award are little gems of insight, compassion, wisdom, and usually humor, indeed whimsy. Even when he is clearly critical and disapproving, Scott Simon displays unwavering decency and fairness, traits in short supply in much of commentary today. But Scott Simon is so much more than a radio news host. Most notably, he is an author of distinction of nine highly acclaimed books, novels, family memoirs, nonfiction works for adults and for teens, a book about his unforgettable mother, a book about Jackie Robinson, a book about a young woman in wartime Sarajevo, a book about he and his wife adopting two baby girls from China, a book about his beloved Chicago Cubs. Yes, an entire book. <laughs> his latest book is the highly improbable, kind of bizarre, but true story of a big band of German jazz musicians that the Nazis created in World War II to broadcast popular swing music laced with the changed lyrics of Nazi propaganda to audiences in Europe and the United States. Scott has titled this upcoming book, with apologies to Mel Brooks, Swing Time for Hitler. <laughs> the W.M. Kiplinger Award for Lifetime Achievement, now in its 40th year, has honored many giants of American journalism and it's a very eclectic group. Unique talents, Seymour Hirsch, George Will, Judy Woodruff, Frank DeFord, Bob Woodward, Robert Siegel, Ben Bradley, Clarence Page, Diane Rehm, Carl Rogan, Rowan, 
Paul Steiger, and many more. Tonight's honoree belongs in this pantheon. The man for whom the award is named, W.M. Kiplinger, was a plain-speaking, clear-writing Midwesterner, a native son of Ohio. Despite 50 years in Washington as an influential and highly successful journalist and publisher, he never got fancy or put on airs. He would be pleased that we're honoring this evening a man who, despite his almost four decades inside the Beltway, remains a clear-thinking, plain-speaking, native son of Chicago. Please welcome Scott Simon. You know, Scott is the ultimate everything in reporting, hosting, journalism. He's a fabulous writer. He is a persistent interviewer. And he's a reporter who never accepts a non-answer. Uh, Scott really, really pays attention to all of the details while sort of taking in the bigger picture. But I think it's also important to present to the public the face, or in Scott's case, more often the voice, of somebody who represents the best of what actual journalism is. Working with Scott uh, day in and day out, I've learned a number of things from him, but I think most significantly, uh, two things that I've taken away from him are humility uh, and also rigor. In terms of humility, Scott's the kind of guy who can talk to anybody, anywhere, at any time. In terms of rigor, whenever you go to pick something to Scott, he applies a very, very heavy and much needed um, editorial pressure. Uh, whenever you're going to say something, you have to be prepared for a thousand questions. Who is this? Why is this important? Why should we do this? Why does the audience need to hear this? Always sort of keeping in mind, what is the takeaway for everything that we do? Um, and if I were to think about what Scott specifically inspired me to do, Scott has an amazing ability to be present as a person in an interview or in any kind of reporting without in any way stealing the spotlight. Week in and week out, he produces essays. Sometimes they're very light, even funny, and sometimes they're very serious and profound and represent all of us in some profound way. Thank you very much. It's uh, a particular honor to be honored with so many. I'm, I'm taking a look here for my remarks, which are in. By the way, I'm going to be the last person up tonight, so you might want to start calling Uber right now. <laughs> Everybody just left theirs on top. Can you imagine? They left some of the most interesting stuff out of here, by the way. I, I don't think I'd ever heard that story. Um, in any event, I, I, I too want to begin by noting um, that we hold hearts in our thought tonight for the family of Dylan Lyons, uh, Spectrum 13 news reporter in Florida, uh, shot and killed at a crime scene this weekend, um, this week. A nine-year-old girl also died. Those are two bright lives. Uh, and I have to note that I speak just the day after NPR announced uh, a 10% reduction in force. And I think we all understand the vagaries of the news business, and we understand and respect the fact that it is a business. But I want to accept this award in honor of those who have given so much of themselves to make those initials, NPR, stand for something that nourishes millions of Americans every day. And to those of you all around this country who support us, your encouragement has never been more vital. I was reading, uh, rereading a memoir recently by Christopher Usherwood who said, I am a collaboration, and I certainly feel that tonight. A highly incomplete list of people 
who gave me so much of themselves and who I have to thank uh, include Jay Curtis, still my partner in crime at CBS, Robert Siegel, Cindy Carpey, and Ken Hom, Peter Breslow, and Sarah Lucy Oliver, who is here tonight, our producer. No doubt thinking, don't go on too long. <laughs> we have a deadline tomorrow. I've had especially close relationships with, with audio artists who have recorded my voice all over the world. Uh, Claude Cunningham and Rich Rary, Michael Schweppe, Leo DeLaguila, Manolita Weatherell, Burke Hun, Stu Rushfield, and many more. My mother, my father, my stepfather. I want to thank my agent, <laughs> Wayne Kaback. He represents a lot of people who bring in a lot more. Uh, but he's been unstinting in his attention and friendship and made it possible for me to do work I love for a family has taught me the meaning of love. My wife, Caroline, who is here tonight, and our daughters, Elise and Paulina, who are very happy not to be here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the other guests speaking, it was me that I think they dreaded. Um, and I want to hold a thought tonight for thousands of people in war zones and inner cities and small towns all over the world who have let me into their lives, often into their lowest moments, to ask painful questions. Thank you for that. Please let me just take a little bit more of your time to share something from my lifetime perspective now that you've all done the math and know exactly how old I am, goddammit. Um, <laughs> There is no safe space in journalism. What we do should come with a caution, warning. What you're about to see or hear or read may contain language, ideas, arguments that you may find alarming, offensive, and upsetting to your view of the world. That is journalism. Now, I've been in societies in which the press is repressed, hounded, locked up, and thrown through windows. And as we've just been so infortuitously reminded, we, we face occasional threats here. But mostly we face occasional lawsuits and obnoxious tweets. We receive awards from each other while reporters in Mexico, Russia, Cuba, China, Iran, the Philippines, Ethiopia, and other societies have to live in fear. Our problems are different and many of our own invention. We have often used the power of the web to connect us to the world, then closed ourselves off from different points of view. We are beginning to take the technology of mass media to carve out niches and echo chambers, rather than trying to reach across divides to people of all backgrounds and beliefs. People can now choose the news they want, or it's chosen for them click by click, so millions of good and conscientious Americans can now fill themselves with only the news that nourishes the views they already hold. And many news enterprises have followed, identifying an audience by algorithms and repeating the same themes, like refrain, story after story. And we've too often allowed ourselves to identify our audience by our most superficial qualities. It's one of the bromides of this business that journalism should speak truth to power. But more and more, I fear we are happy just to speak to ourselves and to like-minded individuals, report after report, tweet after tweet. The whole premise of reporting is to tell stories of people who we may think we have nothing in common because if the story is well and truly told, we will discover that, in fact, we have a lot in common. We're not talking enough to people. We're talking to pundits and to each other and to people with titles, often long ones that disclose by themselves what they're going to say. But we're often not allowing ourselves or our audience to be surprised by real people and their complexities and contradictions. And too often, I think we speak in cliches hyphenated, dialectical, academic, activist, ideological, corporate catchphrase, cut and paste jargon, instead of real language that can be vivid and open to all. 
It's not lost on me that the dispatches of Orwell, Hemingway, Martha Gellhorn, Ben Heck, Stanley Crouch, Joan Didion, and Edward R. Murrow are read in perpetuity because they were lyricists, not polemicists. All of us in this room tonight, I think, have to worry about how artificial intelligence bots might soon replace us. When we do work that is algorithmic, unsurprising, predictable, polemical, and formularic, we make ourselves pretty easy to replace. Look, I hope these remarks might apply to all of us in this business, but not equally. And speaking this week, I have to be specific. I was disgusted these past few days to read the messages that show Fox News executives and hosts consciously reported lies about the legitimacy of the 2020 election because they were sure that's what their audience wanted to hear. They were not even sincere in their fallacies. They had not only a chance, but a duty to help their audience through chaos and confusion. But instead, Fox hosts and executives chose stock price. They shouted fire in the crowded halls of Congress. I think there are a few of us tonight who might have made reference to Chicago. I do believe there's no better place for a reporter to learn about courts and crime and human drama, ethnic strife, race, greatness, art, comedy, loss, life, politics, and the music of the soul. Uh, you know, my, my wife, Caroline, is French. There are times even she is convinced that one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not put ketchup on a hot dog. And that the rallying cry of the French Revolution was liberté, equality, and vote early and often. <laughs> but in fact, the motto of Chicago journalism, which comes from the columnist Peter Pin uh, Finley Peter Dunn, is that our work should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. In these times, I think this means challenging the comfortable notions and nostrums our audiences may have about the world left, right, and center. And I count among my bl many blessings in life to work for NPR, which has not only a business plan, but a purpose. There's a speech in Hector MacArthur's play, The Front Page, that's set in the Chicago criminal courts in which a character, I, there was a revival about three years ago. John Slattery played the part of Hildy Johnson. I like to think now that my hair is silver, that someone would consider me too, but Hildy Johnson has a speech where he says, journalists peeping through keyholes, running after fire engines like a lot of dogs waking up people in the middle of the night to ask them for pictures of their dead loved ones or what they think of Mussolini. A lot of Daffy Budinskis running around with holes in their pants and for what? So a million office workers and motormen and their wives can think they know what's going on? You know, that sounds like a good life to me. <laughs> this is a tough business, it should be. We put a hand on events that can affect elections, human reputations, life and death. A journalism is the profession of the front page, not Mary Poppins. It should be done with decency. But our rumpled forebears in this business were among the deplorables of their times. Obnoxious, rowdy, often vulgar, boorish, and worse, clannish, blinkered, barely civil, and sometimes even hateful. But they opened news to the public, independent of party, lobby, or faction. They told stories about murders, riots, wars, crimes, bribes, revolutions, nonsense, and inanities, because that is all part of our human story. We're here to comfort, but not coddle. Explore and surprise, not scold. Joke, but not mock. And to share some of the sheer fun we have in learning about our world in all of its ludicrous and captivating contradictions. Thanks for listening. There's more to come.